It's good to see you this morning. Um, we are continuing our series, Cross and Crown. Now, many of us here this morning watching online uh, have the shared experience of what it's like to talk to another adult in front of children, which means we're usually trying to say something that we don't want our kids to know. Have you ever had that experience where you're trying to maybe spell something? That's usually how it starts, and then our kids figure out how to spell, and then we regret we taught them how to spell, because now they know what we're saying, what we're thinking. And so we start to use different vocabulary and language to just be a little bit over their heads. It's why we like family movies, too, Uh, because we can sit down, our kids like the animation and the characters and the story, and we like the jokes that our kids don't get that we laugh at. And eventually, teenagers do this to all of us because they talk and we have no idea what they're saying. And their friends know exactly what they're saying, right? Now, it's not that people in these situations aren't listening, but are you really listening? Are you really listening to the deeper meaning behind these things? On a more serious note, last year a woman made headlines because she called 911 to order a pizza. 911 to order a pizza. So the dispatcher is obviously saying this is the wrong number, you've called the wrong place, and she continues to talk and continues to order the pizza, and eventually the dispatcher catches on that she's in trouble. And it goes on to say that there's a domestic violence situation in the home, and she doesn't want that person to know that she's calling 911. The dispatcher could have hung up, but instead he, in all of his training, learned to hear and listen for certain things, to know there was something going on at a deeper level. And so the question for us is are we listening? Are we listening? And in our passage, the verb here is found 13 times, which means Jesus finds it pretty important to teach on this over and over again. So Mark 4 is really trying to show us the spiritual connection between our hearts and our ears. The spiritual connection between our hearts and our ears. And it's one of the few places in Mark where we get an extended teaching of Jesus. And one of Jesus' favorite methods of teaching was using parables. Now, we looked at all of the kingdom parables, many that we're going to look at this morning. We looked at them all in Matthew 13 last spring. So if you want an in-depth look at each one of those parables, I'm pretty much covering almost all of them this morning. Uh, So we can't do that. So you can go back and listen, because we're going to step back and look at kind of the 30,000-foot view, and I'm going to try and draw some things together that we learn um, from these parables. So what are parables? And then we'll get to the why of parables. So Jared Wilson helps us out with um, defining parables in his book, Storytelling God. He says this, The parables function in Jesus' ministry as representative stories about the kingdom of God. The parables, in fact, gives us a peek behind the veil between earth and the place where God's will is most manifest. They show us glimpses of the day when the, the veil is torn and that world conquers and integrates with this one. So that's what parables are are, but why does Jesus use them? And we're going to go a little bit out of order in our text this morning to answer that first question that you see in your notes. Why parables? So let's look at verse 10. I'm going to read through verse 12, and then we're going to jump all the way to the end of our passage in verse 33 and 34. Let's read that together. When he was alone, the 12 and others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seen but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Jump over to verse 33. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. So in what has become known as one of the hard sayings of the many hard sayings of Jesus in the Gospels, he takes us to Isaiah 6. That's what he quotes there for us. To let those around him know why I'm using parables, why I teach this way. And it's tempting as you read that to think this is a pretty mean tactic because of those two words, so that. Like, I'm going to say things so that you don't believe. I'm going to say things so that they don't understand. And it seems harsh. But we cannot forget the context of where we are this morning in the whole gospel of Mark. So since Jesus has been on the scene, in his ministry, we've seen him healing people of their disease. He touched a leper, in fact. He is forgiving people of their sins. He is casting out demons. 
He is eating with tax collectors and sinners. He's not adhering to the strict guidelines put on by the religious leaders for following the Sabbath. All of this is happening in his ministry, and you know what this has led everybody to do? Respond to him. Respond in some way, shape, or form. They have responded to Jesus, and what we see here is people have responded, and they keep coming to him. So what we'll see here in just a moment is crowds of people keep coming to him because of what Jesus can do for them. What he can do for them. Uh, Religious leaders keep coming because they're really interested in what this guy has to say, and they also want to test him. His family came last week, we saw, in Mark 3, to get him because they thought he was crazy and probably even feared for his life. We also saw last week that the whole time this is going on, Jesus has been slowly but surely getting to the point where he is going to call his 12 to follow him, to show that, as we saw last week, he is calling for those who are inside the kingdom and showing others that they are outside the kingdom. Who is in and who is out? Who will follow him and who will not? So he's been doing that already. And then two weeks ago, Jesus had the audacity to heal someone on the Sabbath day. Like, Jesus thought it was a good thing to heal someone, and the religious leaders thought, this is a terrible thing. Which led to them pairing up, going off, and plotting how to kill Jesus with their enemies, the Herodians. They hated each other. What did they hate more? Jesus. So let's partner together and try and figure out how we can get rid of him. So all of that is happening, and then Jesus comes here and he gives us these words. So does it sound quite as harsh? Like, this is where we find Jesus in his ministry now, is all these people are coming with all these different ways that they've responded to him. And I think what we're going to see is there are people on that shoreline that are coming to him with hard hearts already. Not ready to listen. Not ready to really listen and receive what he has to say. And there's some people there who are on the shore who have soft hearts. They're saying, Lord, teach us. I want to know more. I want to understand. So the question before us is, are we really listening? Because ultimately it comes down to these two types of people we met last week. Those who are in the kingdom and those who are not. Those who submit to Christ and those who don't. Now all this becomes clearer in our first parable. So let's go there. We're going to look uh, at the fact that Jesus is looking for disciples, not decisions. Disciples, not decisions. So let's uh, look at 1 through 9 and then we're going to jump to verse 13 for the explanation of the parable. Verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Jump over to verse 13. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on the good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. So you got to love when Jesus explains his own teaching. Because like if I mess this up, I'm in big trouble. All right? He says, Here, here's the parable and here's my explanation for it. So the word is spread by the farmer. Right? And this is Jesus, but really it's anybody who's proclaiming the message about Jesus Christ. And it's important to know at this time, because I'm not a farmer, many of you probably don't have a farming background, that one of the ways they would farm is they would go out and they would just scatter seed broadly. They didn't go around looking for the right exact place to plant, but they would just go out and they would scatter. And that's what we have here. The farmer goes out and he scatters the seed. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing in this moment. The crowds are coming and he just broadly scatters the word to the masses. And he knows this. 
Many will accept it, and others will reject it. He knows when his word goes out, this is what's going to happen. And while he knows everybody's hearts, what we don't see is we might just see somebody accepting it, but are they really listening? I mean, that's what the other two soils here that we're going to see here in a second are are doing. Like they, They appear to accept it, but do they really? Do they last? Do they last? Do they submit and put these things into practice? So for some, we see the word goes in one ear and out the other. Satan comes and snatches it like they never even heard it. And that's a pretty easy one to see, right? There's no change. There's no response at all. And so Jesus probably saw this. The disciples probably saw this. We've probably seen this when we've shared with someone that it's just like we never even shared with them. And that's a pretty clear one. But some will appear to believe. That's what the next two soils show. And I think these next two soils show the difference between being inspired by God's word and being transformed by God's word. And this is a huge danger for us because all of us in the church want to be known as the good soil. Nobody came in here saying like, I am a rocky place. We want to be the good soil. But are we walking out on Sundays? Are we walking out of our time with God in his word or with community groups or journey groups? Are we walking out inspired? Because there's a big difference there. If we walk out inspired, that's a great message. I feel really motivated to go do something right now for the Lord. Maybe you'll do it. Maybe you won't. Maybe that motivation will last for five minutes, ten minutes, a week, a month. But eventually, if we're one of these soils, it will fade away. Somehow, worries, wealth, doubt, questions, persecution, sickness will come in. And these temporary things will force us to make a decision. Will I follow him or will I not? Will I follow Jesus or will I walk away? So that's inspiration. The other option is transformation. And transformation is discipleship. That's what it is. Transformation is a complete change in who we are. No matter what comes our way, because those those things are still going to come. All those things I mentioned are going to come for the disciple. But here's the difference. We continue to submit. Our hearts are soft. We continue to obey. Our hearts are softer. And we live out of his grace and not a motivation of our own making. We live out of his grace and what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross and in the empty tomb. And that drives our change. That drives our change. And that's what real discipleship is. And so Jesus is looking for disciples, not someone making a decision that looks good on the outside. Because that's, that's the crowds. I mean, he's got a crowd of people following him. Many people think that's success. And Jesus said, let me show you your hearts. So I want to say something here. I'm going to say it a couple times. It's true that every follower of Jesus makes a decision for Christ. But not everyone who makes a decision is a follower of Christ. Okay? So it's true that every follower of Jesus makes a decision, but not everyone who makes a decision is a follower of Christ. And that's what this is getting at here. Disciples, not decisions. Everyone who's following Christ has made a decision. You, You have a moment where you repented, you turned from your sin, and you said, I'm following Jesus now. And for some of you, you had that date, you had that time, and you remember it. For others of you, like, I'm not really sure, but I'm living that way now. But you've had a moment where you've had to make that decision to follow Jesus. The difference, again, between somebody who makes a decision and appears is they keep pointing back to this one time I did this prayer, and you can't see anything different in their life now. But for the disciple, they say, well, well, Jesus continues later on in Mark 8, which we'll get to in a month or so, and he says, if you're truly my disciple, you will deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow me. And that's every day. So disciples make decisions, we just make them every single day. Every single moment we are saying, I'm following Jesus, I'm following Jesus, I'm denying this, I'm following Jesus. There is a moment and a time where we have decided that that first time to follow him. But if we're 16 years old and we did that when we were four, we're 30 years old, we did that when we were four, and we just keep saying, yeah, I prayed a prayer once, but there's no fruit, we really have to sit back and have some self-reflection on what we're really saying in those moments. Now, I would think that many of us here are confident that the gospel has taken root in our lives. The question still remains, are we really listening? Because there's something for us in this parable as well. Two quick things. One, our hearts can still be hard. 
As believers, our hearts can still get hard because we will choose not to obey or submit in different situations or at different times. So we might not be listening. And all we have to do is look at the disciples. In Mark 8, again, we'll get there in a little while, there's another time where Jesus says something to his disciples and they don't understand. They don't get it. And he says this to them. He says, do you still not see and understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? Like he's still explaining things that the the disciples just can't get. And then the disciples sometimes didn't understand the plain teaching of Jesus. Like when he told them, I'm going to die, and they walk out like, what? What does he mean by this? It's like he means he's going to die. Like so they didn't even understand the plain teaching of Jesus all the time. So that's the first thing. Our hearts can still be hard. So we need to make sure our hearts are soft to the Lord as well. The second thing is we cannot go around looking for the right people to plant the seed with of the gospel. That's what we see here. Scatter broadly. We scatter the seed oftentimes to the same people over and over and over again until we want to stop. And then we keep doing it, right? We keep doing it. We need to scatter the seed broadly. We cannot go around and say, hey, are you, is your heart good soil today? All right? That's not our job. Our job is to be faithful in proclaiming the gospel. God knows their hearts. He knows what's going to happen. And when we do that, people's hearts will be hardened or they will be softened. But our responsibility is to scatter the seed broadly. And I know I've prayed this. I'm sure many of you have prayed this before. Lord, give me the right opportunity. From the time we wake up to the time we go to bed is the opportunity. If we're scattering broadly, right? If we're scattering broadly and saying, I'm just going to take the word out in my day. And the way that I interact with people, the way that I talk to people, I'm going to scatter and I'm going to trust that the seed will take in good soil. And so for those of us who like the good soil, accept it, receive God's word, trust him, we see a a harvest being produced in our lives and fruit in our lives, we are called to take the gospel to a world in desperate need of knowing who Jesus is. And we spread the seed because Jesus came to be made public, not private. That's the second point there. We're going to look at verses 21 through 25. Public, not private. Verse 21, he said to them, do you bring a lamp in to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. So here's these two, like, rhetorical questions that make the point that, of course, a lamp is meant to be brought inside and displayed so that the light could actually show what it's supposed to show. The people that are there, the things in the room, that's what a lamp is for. And what was really interesting is I was doing study for this. I came across commentator after commentator who were drawing out something really, really important from the original language here. Because in the Greek, not only did Mark make the lamp the acting subject in this sentence, he refers to it with a definite article. So he's saying the lamp. So a more literal reading is, does the lamp come in order that it might be placed under the bowl or under some bed? Who is the lamp? Who is the light of the world? Well, it's Jesus. Jesus wants everybody to see him as the lamp. He's the one that's come to reveal. This makes sense in the context, too, because not only has Jesus been revealing himself since the beginning of Mark, he wants people to know who he's claiming to be. This light reveals, and Jesus has been revealing himself, and now he's revealing the hearts of his hearers. So as the lamp, he has come down to make known the mystery, these secrets of the kingdom. He's come to make them known. And John picks up on this in John chapter 1, and I want to read it for us. It says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. He's come to reveal who God is. He's come to reveal the hearts of the people. 
So what this is saying, you cannot separate the message from Jesus or Jesus from the message. Jesus is the message. The message is Jesus. When we proclaim the gospel, we're proclaiming Jesus. That's why other gospels are so dangerous. Because they're getting away from Jesus and they're saying the message is all these other things. But the message is Jesus and his grace and what he has done and accomplished on the cross for us. And he has done this to be made public. For others to see, to reveal. We don't hide Jesus. I mean, when I say that, it sounds absurd, right? Like, I'm going to just hide Jesus under a bowl. But he's the light in the darkness. And so he came publicly, and yet we've seen even in Mark here that his ministry was not very far-reaching. It was more of a regional ministry. And so how could he really reveal himself publicly to the entire world? The answer is you and me. The answer is us as a church. We are called to make our faith public, not private. And I'm not making this up. Jesus said this in Matthew 5. You'll see it on the screen, I believe. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16, he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. And this will sound familiar. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We must make known the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. He came to reveal himself, to be made public, to call us to listen, to really listen. And if we are good soil producing fruit, we must shine before others. And it's not to shine to say, look how great I am. It's to shine to show how great Jesus is. And it makes sure people see him. And then verses 23 through 25 really asks us the same question again. Are you really listening? If you don't understand the parables, if you listen and follow Jesus, if you understand them, if you listen and follow Jesus, there will be more and more to learn. There will be more and more understanding and more and more submission to God's commands. One commentator said, where parables find a willing response, further explanation is given. Where there is no response, the message is lost. And this is a principle we know in life too. Um, if you ever have worked out and you've got muscles at one point, now you don't have muscles anymore. Why don't you have muscles? You stopped working out. Some people just put their heads down, like really. (laughs) How do you get those muscles back? You work them out again. They're not just going to appear. Like this principle is something we see all the time, right? And so here, if we come and our hearts are soft, we're going to understand. If we come and our hearts are soft again, we're going to understand more. And we say, oh, I want to obey. And when I obey, I understand more. And you keep coming back. But if you come every time, a hard heart, a hard heart, you're going to walk away. You're going to be frustrated. Like, "Ah, I'm going to go again anyways. And you're going to hear something, something that you should be doing in light of God's grace. And you walk out and you say, "Ah, I don't want to do that. And your heart starts to harden. And you know what happens? You come back and you're more frustrated when you hear God's word. You're more confused when you hear God's word. Till eventually you just stop coming. That's what a hard heart is. And so a word to parents, grandparents, disciple makers, this is where we need to be really sensitive. Because the church, unfortunately, has made many false converts. And many times it's happening with kids. Many times it's happening with kids. The younger generations, do we have people building into their lives saying, this is the gospel, this is why you follow Jesus, this is why he is better, and walking alongside them in this process. Because let me tell you, teenagers and young adults don't walk away from the church in a moment. They don't. If you talk to the ones who do, and you start to kind of dig a little bit deeper, you find out they've been walking away from the Lord for years. And not that they were, you know, like, clenched fists towards God, it was, ah, I, I didn't really agree with that in the Bible. So I didn't, I didn't follow that. Hard heart. And I, I didn't like what Jesus said here, so I'm not going to follow that. Hard heart. Right? Or I'm not going to deal with the sin in my life. Hard heart. Till eventually there comes a point where they just walk away. And for many of us, we're shocked. But if we dig deep and we, we, we go into these conversations and find out, many times it's because the soil's been hard for a long time. Right? And so... I thought I got this out first hour. <clears throat> That's on us as a church, right? They make their own decisions. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying it's on us as a church to know that that's happening in their life. 
And that's why we as a church have this huge discipleship initiative for the kids in this church, through the high schoolers in this church, to be working one-on-one or in a smaller group with somebody outside their family to hopefully encourage and do what their family is already doing, but to do this in a different type of relationship where they have someone to say, I have doubts, I have struggles, I'm really not sure what this means. And they can say, well, let me tell you, let me explain it. They will make their own decisions, yes, but we need to know when that starts. Not be shocked when they walk away. And of course, we pray that over time, their hearts become softer to the Lord. So what do we learn about the kingdom of God then in these next verses? Verses 26 through 32, we find out that the kingdom of God is fruitful but not flashy. Okay, fruitful but not flashy. Let's read it together. Verse 26, he also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. So like the earlier parable of the sower, we're back to seeds. And what we see here is these seeds, the word of God, has a huge impact. And, and it goes and it expands this kingdom far greater than we could ever imagine. Ultimately, the point here in these verses is to say that the work of God in the kingdom of God, or sorry, in the kingdom of God, this is God's work. He is doing this work. I mean, the farmer's planting the seed like, I have no idea how this is working. Have you ever had that moment where you're like, just say something to somebody from God's word and like, it's like, how does that work? Because the word has power. The word is living and active. It is doing something. Isaiah 55 says, when the word goes out, it's going to do what it's supposed to do. It's going to accomplish what God wants to accomplish. And again, sometimes that's hardening and sometimes that is softening the heart, but it will not and never does fail. So what this means is for us is that we don't have to be flashy with our approach to personal evangelism. We don't have to be flashy. We as a church will not be flashy. We just need to be faithful. Like the farmer's faithful. The farmer plants and takes care. But God is the one who does the work. So this should remind us of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7. He says there, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So it's not that methods are bad, It's not that innovation is bad or starting new ministry initiatives. It's not bad to go out and do a Google review. We just heard about that this morning. That's not a bad thing. But why is that there? So there isn't a stumbling block to somebody not coming to this church where they will hear the gospel. The review isn't the power. The word is the power. We just are hoping to get more people here. And so this this happens, though, um, where we, we focus on the flashy if, if, if we focus on that too much, we will get away from the power of the word and think it's in our method, and that is dangerous. Uh, Ray Ortland, pastor in Nashville, I hope you all listen and read him because he's fantastic. He says this, in Acts, they preached and awe came down. You can't put that in your worship order. 10 a.m., awe comes down. You can't put that in your, but, but what we can do is we preach the gospel and hopefully awe comes down. The word is going to do the work. It never fails. So we preach the gospel. Throughout church history, we have seen this parable taking place in the lives of people. People responding to God's word because it's living and active. And it's transformative, not just inspirational. It's transforming hearts and lives. And this is the harvest we get to in verse 29. That there is a harvest that is coming. So do you believe in the power of the message and not the messenger? It's not us. Like Brandon and I, if we're up here preaching, we have nothing to say to you unless it's from here. My kids are in the back. They know I don't know a whole lot. They're, they're, they're finding that out quickly. Right? So what can I offer them? This book. Understanding this book. Teaching them this book. Because everything else should be influenced by this book. Everything else I say should be influenced by this book. 
I think sometimes we have this thing like when we sit down with somebody, we need to have the Bible open and take them to a certain passage. But what I love is when I'm with somebody who's much older than me, much, much wiser, and has been in the Word a lot longer than me, it just comes out of them in their conversation, in what they say. Yeah, God's Word isn't open, but it's been written on their hearts, and they just, it's just always there. Right? It's always there. So it needs to be a part of our lives, and we let the Holy Spirit take it and do the work that we know he can do in that good soil. And when the growth takes place, and God is ready, he brings the harvest, and that harvest will be great. And then we see this small mustard seed represents the kingdom of God, and this time it's showing the expanse. Like, how, how far out is this kingdom going to go? And what we see in a tiny mustard seed is, is it will grow to a 10 to 12 foot um, high tree where birds can actually come and nest. Well, Jesus started small with a small group of men, men and women in that 120 in the early church. He started with something very small, but what we read in Revelation is there will be people from every tribe, language, tongue, everybody. Everybody will be, will be represented around the throne of Jesus Christ from seemingly insignificant seed to changing the world. So last year we looked at this parable. I actually was the one that preached on this parable, and so we were in that parable the whole time. So a lot is being left unsaid, but what I talked about in that one specifically was the fact that many of us are believing the myth of decline, meaning the church is dying. And we believe this myth that the church is actually declining, but what we looked at is the fact that that's because all we see is right here. We see our own little world, and oh no, people aren't coming to church, and oh no, all these different things are happening, but God is doing something around the world that is amazing. It's not just about us. His kingdom is going forth into all the world. And what I know is that disciples are being made, not just decisions. People are willing to not only give up their life, but to leave everything behind to follow Jesus. The church is not dying. Christianity is not dying. The kingdom is not getting smaller. It is growing. So don't believe the myth of decline. Don't believe the myth that the Bible is irrelevant and outdated. Instead, listen to it. Really listen to the kingdom work that God is doing. The kingdom work that God is doing because it will lead to an amazing harvest. What we know from this is the kingdom cannot be stopped, so let's join in. The kingdom can't be stopped, so let's join in and be a part of this amazing work that God is doing. We are not a flashy church. Brandon and I don't have flashy personalities. Right? We're not a flashy church. We don't want to be a flashy church. We want to be a fruitful church. And we're pretty confident we know the ministry Jesus has left for us. And that is a pretty simple one. Not flashy. But it's a long, time-consuming, at times very frustrating, messy, rewarding, joy-filled, gospel-centered, God-glorifying work of discipleship. That's what he has called us to do. And that, we know, leads to a fruitful harvest. Flashy stuff, we have no idea. It might last for a week. It might last for a couple months. It might last for a few years. But that transformative discipleship, that's what's going to bring the harvest. So how do we know? As we kind of close things here, how do we know if we're really listening? It's a simple answer. Does your listening turn to action? Okay, does your listening turn to to action because of Jesus and for Jesus. Just like the crowds were coming 2,000 years ago to hear Jesus preach on a boat, like so many people that had pushed him into going on a boat as a pulpit, it challenges us to respond as well. So for the two groups I mentioned earlier, those who are in the kingdom and those who are outside the kingdom, how are you going to respond? If that first one is you, you know, like after hearing these parables, you know your heart has been hard. That God's word is falling on a soil that it won't take. The first step is to step back and listen. Really listen. Take in God's word. Consider Jesus and his claims. And pray that he would show you. He would show you more of himself. Hear what he calls you to do. Hear what he says. Lay everything down and respond to him in repentance and faith. You won't have everything figured out. And that's okay. All we're looking for is a soft heart that gets a little bit softer, a little bit softer, a little bit softer. So we turn from our sin, we trust in him, the one who brought us light and life so that you can experience the kingdom of God in part now and in the fullness at the harvest time with him. 
And the next thing, this is for all of us today, regardless of where we find ourselves, whether we're in or outside the kingdom, is how is God calling me to respond today? Okay. So what kingdom truth do you need to believe and put into practice? Are you sitting here thinking maybe the Bible is irrelevant? Are you sitting here thinking like, oh my goodness, the church is in decline? Are we, gonna, are we even going to last through this? Do you believe that? Do you, do you believe that you're a good soil when maybe you need to start looking at your life, getting others to put their input in and say whether or not this is something they actually see in you? So what kingdom truth do you need to believe and to put into practice? Because I believe the Holy Spirit is the one putting that on your heart right now. And if you're in community groups, you know we always have a question of something like, hey, what are you going to do this week, this month, this year? What are practical steps you are going to take to do the word we just heard? To be doers and not hearers only. How are you going to live out of God's grace this week, this month, this year? Because we want to be doers of the word and not hearers only. But community groups is the place for you to soften your heart. It really is. To walk out of there with things that you know the Lord is calling you to do. And if you are obedient to him, your heart will be a little bit softer for the next time you hear his word proclaimed. So as you reflect on today's message, as you talk about it, as you read for next week, as, you, as we keep going through the Gospel of Mark, please keep asking this question. Am I really listening? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we know you are a good God, that you are, and we are so grateful that you even talk to us, that you give us your word, your written word that we could pick up every day, your living word who gave us our salvation as a gift if we will just turn and trust. And Lord, I pray that for all of us, as we've heard your word this morning, you would be softening our hearts. That the seed that's been planted will take and it will grow and we will be producing a crop, not for our own glory, but for your glory, knowing one day that that harvest will come. Lord, for anybody here this morning whose heart is hard, whether they've never trusted in you as their Savior, whether they have years ago, but they just know right now they're not living an obedient life to you, they're not submitting to what you are calling them to do, Lord, break through that as only you can. Soften all of our hearts this morning, Lord. For your glory, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go ahead and stand. Just want to encourage you, if you want to talk, we'd love to have you hang out and talk. I think the rain is done, so we're going to kind of move on the outside under the portico uh, to continue your conversations. Um, And then remember, if you are interested in the virtual tour of the city, let us know so we can get you that Zoom link today. But as you go, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.